So welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. This is the talk of Stefan, health promotion responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the first question that I will ask uh, Stefan is what can health promotion contribute in terms of management of the pandemic? Thank you, Gov. Of course, as Gov just mentioned, um, this is, of course, a situation that's unprecedented. And I don't need to explain that part of the story, too. I think uh, if you look at not only the threat of, the, of a very important disease, but especially also all the measures that have been taken to, to, uh, to prevent the virus from spreading, um, it's something that we haven't seen yet before. It's probably one of the biggest uh, behavioral uh, experiments in mankind that we are now living and witnessing. And also the consequences of that on our daily lives, and, uh, of course, the economic consequences, but also in terms of people feeling enclosed and having uh, less contacts or, or less opportunities to have contacts. So there's a huge impact that we are all facing. With. And within all, um, one could ask themselves, yourself the question, what does health promotion have to contribute? Isn't this mainly a problem for epidemiologists and doctors, nurses, and let's say the caring professors, uh, the profession, sorry, that are really uh, key here? But I think, uh, in fact, health promotion has an important role to play, and I think probably more important than ever before. Um, I think for a, a number of good reasons. First of all, um, as we all are aware, uh, a lot of it involves pre preventive behavior change. So many of the measures that need to be put in place involve the changing of our behavior, not only by citizens, but also by health workers uh, within the healthcare sector. Secondly, um, the fact that we are confronted by, by such a dramatic situation means that um, amongst the population, there's the feeling often that our system for health and health care, public health and health care, is not really up to standards and does not manage to cope with it. So it means that there's a loss of control, or at least a perception of loss of control. In some cases, unfortunately, that is the case. In other cases, it might be just a perception, but perceptions are also important. So um, there is a need for people to regain control. And regaining control over one's life and over the things that impact on disease and health is, of course, something that is at the heart of health promotion. And so I think that health promotion can help to, uh, to tackle the pandemic and its consequences. And that not only by looking at the downstream level where people act and behave, but also at the midstream, so more organizational level, interventions, hospitals, but also organizations, schools, uh, enterprises, and so on and so forth. And uh, last but certainly not least, also at the upstream level, the level where uh, governments act. So um, on the next slide, um, I would then like to show the important, first of all, at the downstream level. As, as Joe said, it is introduction to this, uh, uh, to this um, seminar. Um, the, all over the world, health authorities have, of course, acted already. They have tried to make people develop and, and, and state protective behavior. And the way they did that is the way that governments often act. So they provide information, hoping that people will take it up. Sometimes that was not enough. Most of the time that was not enough. So they uh, also issued warnings. And in many cases, there were also legal restrictions to make sure that people would behave in a safer way. Um, this was sometimes effective, but not always effective. And especially in the beginning of the pandemic, we noticed that many of the health warnings were basically not, not attended to and not uh, listened to. Um, very often, the first reaction also of governments was then that, oh, those who don't act on our warnings are, is, are irresponsible, they're selfish, they are not really um, doing what we are wanting them to do. Now, that, of course, is a very understandable reaction on the part of the government, but I think it helps to look at what health behavior specialists can say about this and 
I think, health promotion are also health behavior specialists. If we look at the many models that we have been using for this now to understand health-related behavior, um, and I'm not going to give a whole expose about the different models, but by and large, what we can say is that just giving information or issuing health warnings or even uh, imposing legal restrictions will not do the job because people will only act on health warnings if a number of conditions apply. First of all, people have to apply the health warnings to themselves. They have to believe that they are personally vulnerable and susceptible. So if I think that um, it's not me who's going to, to suffer from COVID when I get infected, um, but somebody else might, then of course I will be less likely to change my behavior and protect myself, keep the distance, uh, wear masks and so on. If I think that maybe, yes, I can be infected, but I don't have chronic disease, I'm, I'm not that young, but I'm not over 85, so I can, I can have the idea or the belief that the consequences will actually not be so severe. That again is a reason why people will not necessarily change their behavior. And uh, another condition is that um, we have to believe also in the effectiveness of what we are asked to do. If someone thinks that wearing a face mask is not really going to help very much, or if social distancing is not really the best way, then of course that is also going to have an impact on the behavior. And last but not least, we have to be able, even if we believe that we're susceptible to, to be infected, that the consequences are severe, and that it's possible and important to, um, to, for example, protect ourselves, if we see ourselves as incapable of doing it, we will not do it. So we know that normally all these consequences have to be in place for the health warnings to have an impact on the behavior. And we can tell that in the case of COVID-19, that's not always the case. We, already gave some examples of that. So that's, um, that's one of the reasons why we understand that we um, don't see the, the behavior change that we had hoped for, uh, especially not in the beginning of the uh, epidemic. And that uh, means it's not just because people are selfish or stupid, it's because we don't use the right way of informing. Now, there's another caveat as well. Uh, we can also overdo things, and that's something we can also see happening in COVID. Um, when people are uh, too scared, when anxiety is too high, which in, in a lot of cases is also uh, seen um, with regard to COVID-19, then people will not necessarily change their behavior, they will change their cognitions, their thoughts, because nobody likes to be anxious all the time. So uh, what we then see is that people will basically tell themselves that it's not really that bad. We know this happens. We've seen it for tobacco. We've seen it for HIV AIDS. So this also is very likely to happen with regards to COVID-19. And if this gets extreme forms, people will not just cognitive avoidance strategies. They may downright avoid uh, getting knowledge, getting informed. People are also capable of showing resistance to becoming uh, informed about health. So I think uh, these are some of the things we should keep in mind. Um, and in the next slide, uh, both of you want to go there. We now come to a, a different stage. And despite the fact that indeed, as we said earlier on, that uh, WHO is also even today saying that the, the, the epidemic, the pandemic, sorry, is still further developing. In Western Europe, for example, and in Australasia as well, we see that um, thanks to the lockdown that uh, there is more control and now the massive uh, protective uh, measures that have been taken are being relaxed. We are um, uh, being a bit more flexible about certain behaviors. Now, that's again a problem of behavior, not the behavior change as such, but the behavior maintenance. Because despite the fact that um, we can be a little bit less worried and we have the feeling that some of the worst uh, can be controlled, it can only be controlled if we maintain the behavior that protects us from being infected. And what we see already is that as the measures are being relaxed, that people are beginning to, to show uh, less protective behavior. And again, this is something we know from behavior 
uh, research, um, protective behavior will only be uh, maintained um, under given so circumstances. And the changing of behavior, the making people change their behavior, is not the same as maintaining that behavior. So uh, relying on health warnings, fewer appeals and legal restrictions will not, again, do the job. And that's what we see happening now. So what we should do uh, at this stage is to use more effective ways of changing the behavior in, in the sense of maintaining behavior change. Uh, and what can help there is, first of all, establishing social norms. So if we have the norm, if we see that it is expected of us, because it's imposed, but because we believe that is something we are we should do, that is something that is certainly a much more powerful way of influencing the behavior and maintaining the change to protect ourselves. Uh, another way of doing that is to to make changes in the context. If we have a context that facilitates the protective uh, behavior, of course, we will be more likely to do that. And uh, you see that already being applied in the form of nudges. I know that within health promotion, nudging is and remains somewhat controversial, but it is, of course, also a way to create a context that, that elicits and, and, and uh, encourages protective behavior. So if we have uh, lines on the floor or availability of face masks, uh, these things will be much more um, uh, important or much more effective than issuing warnings not in the, in the point or the, at the place where people have to maintain the behavior. And on, last but not least, I think um, one thing we can try to establish and, and, and hope to establish is the power of habits. Uh, habits are incredibly important in, in maintaining behavior. And if we manage to make it into a habit that people protect themselves, keep a social distance, wash their hands and so on, uh, then I think we can, we can see much more effects of that. Um, habit is something which can work against behavior change, but once you have established the behavior, that's, uh, that's much more preventative. And uh, of course, uh, it is very powerful. We see that with toothbrushing, for example, we brush our teeth because we do it um, and not because each time we think very, very elaborately that we really have to do it to avoid certain problems with our teeth. So um, once we get into the, the stage where we can make preventative behavior against COVID-19 a habit, I think we would be on the right track. And so that's more at the level of the, um, of the downstream. If we now go to the next slide, then um, we can go a little bit more up and move to the midstream level. Because um, we can, of course, expect people to change their behavior and, and, and try to do our best there at an individual level. But it's even better if we manage to also influence and empower organizations and communities to help people to, to adopt preventative behavior. Um, and in order to do so, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think we can also really build on uh, the knowledge that exists within communities and organizations. Um, I think it's, it would be uh, uh, not using not using the existing knowledge uh, specifically on how an organization or a community really works, I think would be a shame and would be a missed opportunity because um, community partners are the ones who really know what makes people tick within their community. They know the habits also culturally defined. And, and uh, those are the facts that can help to translate the more general and generic uh, advice into more specific and useful um, hints and make uh, and, and take into account also the sensitivities within certain communities, whether it's age related or culturally related, or um, in terms of the, the less, uh, the more vulnerable populations, I think it's especially worthwhile there. Um, this can not only lead to a better um, uh, effectiveness of the measures, but also strengthen the capacities of the communities themselves, not only to deal with this, with this problem, but also the future problems uh, related to COVID-19 or even for other uh, problems that present in the future. So uh, we know from, um, from research in health promotion that resilience and trust are factors that really play a key role 
And so I think it's important to try and, and reinforce those as well. So apart from being a good avenue and a good place where we can try to, to, uh, to get the information across, I think we should also uh, try to strengthen the capacities of the organizations themselves. And again, this is something help promotion knows about. This is something we've been doing for decades um, regarding other problems, um, but I think we can build on it. It means that we have to also look into the available strengths and, and, and strengthen those, uh, but uh, of course, that is something we are not doing. So that was my long answer to the first question. Back to you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I think it's very comprehensive and you covered uh, a lot of ground and relevant, uh, relevant and familiar in the ears and eyes of health promotion and encouraging and interesting for others with different backgrounds. And uh, well, as you said in your uh, talk, uh, we have the, the greatest experiment here for, uh, uh, and as I said in my introduction, seven and a half billion people uh, are involved in some way. So, and it really shows how you have explained uh, the downward and midstream and uh, upstream developments that health promotion has really uh, an answer to many of these uh, issues. So um, I would like to ask um, uh, my colleagues if there have been any questions during the answering of your first uh, part of your presentation. Yes. Yes, Sylvia. We have two questions. Yep. Um, the first question is how the word social distance, distancing became popular, as it should be physical distancing and uh, attempting to practice spatial proximity uh, mm -hmm. and not social distancing. Yep. And the second question is from our Spanish colleague. Uh, during the lockdown, uh, there were a lot of neighborhood support networks and voluntary work among neighbors. Uh, and the question is now how to maintain this community participation uh, after the acute phase of the pandemic and after the confinement. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Sylvia. So, uh, Stefan, yeah. can you answer I, these questions? Well, uh, you I agree with the first, uh, well, not a question, but a comment. Uh, I, I don't know why certain names get certain names. I mean, um, this is something that we just see. And I totally agree. We should, we should totally avoid social distancing, we increase uh, and enhance, for the moment at least, uh, physical distancing um, in order to prevent getting infected with the, uh, with the virus here with the coronavirus. But um, now that the name has, has become so well known, I think we'll have to stick with it because if we would now reintroduce other words and other terms, I think that might create confusion. And then I think uh, if, if there's one thing that, that uh, we have to avoid now is to create more confusion, especially now that in parts of the world, the, the measures are being a bit more relaxed. And so uh, I, I would, suggest to stick with the social distancing now that people understand actually that it means physical distancing. So that's my evasive reply to the first question. I yeah. But it's maybe, if I may add to uh, Stefan, one of the most complicated challenges, I think, in the whole behavior change that we have to go through and unique, that we have to keep a distance of one and a half meter or in different countries, different lengths. That's, have, that's never been done before. You know, when you watch television, you can see a pre-corona or a post-corona program, you know, mm -hmm. um, and a uh, lot of protests coming up in our societies, particularly about this, you know, loosening the lockdown rules means how can you maintain the one and a half meter when you are going to, with your friends, to a, a pub or a bar, you know, uh, or uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think it is. That's the challenge for sure. Um, and I think um, one of the ways in which we, well, the, the one and a half meter is not just in, not just a, by accident. I think it's a, there's a good reason for it. And I think the problem would be that if we don't explain enough why it is that distance and what the purpose is, then I think uh, people will not understand. And then I think there's a, a lower chance of, of, of actually having 
and success uh, because we don't really um, prohibit certain things. I think we try to help and we try to explain why it's important to, to have this distance. So yes, I, um, I think it's, it's true. And especially uh, like you mentioned, now that people are beginning to relax the measures or now that measures are being relaxed um, and people will ask themselves questions, especially also when they see that maybe when they have a closer contact, that not everybody who needs somebody, touches somebody will immediately uh, drop dead or, or even in the next few days drop dead. So I think it's a matter of developing social norms. I think we should also invest in having um, examples uh, of, of, of leaders, opinion leaders um, and influences uh, saying not only that they themselves maintain and respect the distance, but also explaining why. Um, I don't think it's good enough if governments are taking up that role. I think society should also respect it. Yep. And to come back to the other question that... Yes, please, just briefly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the fact, of course, that, uh, that there is... There has been a great show of resilience and of, of uh, support within communities, incredibly positive and hopeful. Um, will this disappear when, um, when we relax the measures? I'm not so sure about that. I think it shows communities are resilient and that, uh, that there is a lot of resources available within communities and organizations. So in that way, I think, um, Every crisis brings us and the worst. And I think some of the best is that the fact that we notice that we haven't completely gone completely uh, individual and isolated. Yeah. So I'm quite sure that this is not going to completely wear off. Obviously, again, um, we have to make sure that we draw on these strengths and reinforce them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. I proceed. We continue. There are some comments also on the chat, but uh, we have to continue with that. Uh, thank you for everybody for your input. Uh, mm -hmm. As far, for example, European Public Health School Association is involved in this change from social distance to physical distance and COVID can promote new forms of communications, making mm -hmm. social distance much less social. Yeah. Okay. Now, so, we, I suppose we propose question. we continue to the next slide, uh, Stefan, with the next question. Yeah. Fake news, understanding complex issues, health knowledge. How can we develop the capacity of each individual to take charge of their own health? So this is a question that I, uh, I, I really like to answer to because it uh, links up with uh, one of the uh, keywords, I think, in, in, in health promotion these days, which is health literacy. Um, I think it's, um, it's important, of course, uh, that in order to, to take up measures that, uh, and to take control of the lives people, must be well informed. And um, I think that, that goes not only about taking preventive measures, but also the whole picture, how to deal with the situation. Now, the issue is that uh, as, as with other health problems and health situations as well, with respect to COVID-19, there's a bombardment of information. There's far too much information available. And um, you, I mean, when you put on the news, there's COVID, when you talk to people, there's COVID, so there's, it comes from all sides. And of course, uh, this is not helpful in itself. We, we need information, but we need the right information. So the challenge is not to add more information. I think what we now have to do is to make sure that people have the skills and the capacities to, to get access to the information they need, and that gives answer to, this question, to their questions. So that means that the information has to be accurate and reliable, which is basically uh, almost the definition of health literacy. So we can give people to not only get access to information, but also to understand it and to, 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 to really to make the difference between reliable and unreliable information. So if we, if we translate to, to, uh, to the COVID-19 situation, I think we need to make sure in the information that we, and I'm, I mean the health authorities in this case, uh, put at the disposal of the people and the population. We have to make sure that the, that the information is understandable, that the information is transparent, and that it is consistent. Um, so that even people who don't have a degree in public health understand what it means to keep social distance, that people know what risks are, and that we avoid the problem of either underestimating or overestimating. I think um, 
Also, uh, repetition is important. We know from health literacy research that explaining something in easy terminology, but also repeating will, will certainly help. And we should not be afraid to, um, to correct information because what you often hear is, oh, um, the experts now, they say one thing, then they say the other thing. Now face masks were used to be unimportant. Now they, they are important. I think we should uh, not be afraid to, uh, to, to, to change if we need to change the information, if we have more insight. But I think we should, of course, be consequent and consistent in the way in which we answer the questions of the people. And uh, what we certainly should not do is to play the, uh, the game of, uh, of uh, um, accusing people and, and seeking scapegoats uh, and blaming. I think we should uh, strengthen the uh, capacity of people to be well informed. And if you go to the next slide, though, of that. Um, um, I think uh, if we really want to understand what makes people act on health information, I think we should really also consider the cognitive processes behind it. Um, information handling is not something where somebody passively receives information and acts accordingly. Um, it is a very active process. And so even in the sources of information and the type of information we take from those sources, we are very selective, all of us are. Uh, so the situation in which we live, this, the, the people that we interact with, uh, all the emotions that we have, they influence the way in which we look for information and the kind of information that, that we take in or not. Uh, so we, we have to be aware that there's a lot of information bias and not only in seeking information, but also in processing that information. Um, when we, um, when we try to understand and when we try to judge whether certain information is, uh, is relevant or not and is useful or not for us, I think, again, we, we apply certain cognitive mechanisms. We compare with what we already know, for example, or we compare also the different sources that we can, that we can access. And for example, um, there's among many people the tendency to attach more importance to negative information than to positive information. So that in itself introduces a bias. The opposite exists just as well, not necessarily in the same people, but they can, they can coexist. And so also the, the fact that we tend to act more on recent information than on information that has a little bit longer, uh, that's, that's been there for a little bit longer. So I think trying to understand the mechanisms be, behind how information is taken in and, and processed, I think is very important. And this is in, in, uh, certainly important uh, in the next slide then. If we, um, if we look at the, um, the way in which the news about COVID is being uh, driven, um, we notice that there's quite a lot that is not really reliable. So not only do we have too much information, a lot of it is actually totally unreliable. And this really is very noticeable in the so-called myths about COVID-19. Uh, which are abound, and even uh, high-profile people are victim to the myths and believe myths and reinforce the myths. So, for example, the fact that it's uh, it's that it's made or or maybe escaped out of a, of a laboratory somewhere in China, for example, or also with regard to ways to protect. Uh, uh, so, it, there are a lot of a lot of uh, totally unsubstantiated facts um, or rumors. That, uh, that can start living a life on their own. Now, this wouldn't be so bad if we would all consult the same sources of information, but that's not necessarily the case. And uh, false beliefs about uh, the coronavirus and COVID-19 are, are reinforced by the fact that we often rely on specific sources of information and close our eyes and ears for information that doesn't confirm. Them. This is what we call echo chamber or illusion of truth effects where, where we basically just hear the same things and because we always hear the same things we think they're true. Um, so I think there's uh, an important task also to try and, and battle that. I think we should uh, really emphasize the need for people to counter check, to not just take information as it comes but really counter check. Uh, to, to look at which sources uh, are actually being used to get that information from. Um, and um, 
there's a number of, of specific tasks we can do there or, or tricks we can we can for example ask who is behind the information what's the intention so just a number of basic questions but they are very helpful uh, certainly also I try to verify by comparing to other sources and last but certainly not least uh, ask people to not uh, share information unless they're sure that it is worthwhile listening to. So I think there's a lot we need to do about fake news industry uh, in, in regards to COVID-19. So I'll Thank leave you very much, uh, Stefan. Very, very uh, interesting and relevant. And uh, during your talk uh, and answering this question, uh, one of the participants said that there is not enough participation in the formative stages of health information. Uh, I mean, how to involve vulnerable populations. And one aspect that I also thought when you were speaking is, uh, for example, in my country, the Netherlands, there are 16% uh, of our population has difficulty or is not able to read. And I heard, I read a lot about the complexity of the messages and the fact, for example, that when our government presented measures, they have a lot of letters behind them and for somebody who has difficulty reading, it's impossible. It's really distracting. I, I think indeed um, we, we should apply here. And we is, I think, not just the health people and the health specialists and health promotion specialists, but also governments that, uh, that are trying to, to, to come to grips, grips with the epidemic. I think we should learn from what, what is already implemented with regard to health literacy in the healthcare sector more and more, uh, which is not as much implemented when it comes to this new epidemic. So really make sure that information is very accessible. Uh, I think uh, you named um, the experience in the Netherlands, but I can, I can also name one of the positive things in, in Belgium, for example, in the beginning of the epidemic, the, there was one, one slogan that is stay at home, stay at home. And that's what people understand. Yeah. Um, and so, it doesn't mean that you put down the people's intelligence when you use simple slogans and slim, simple instructions. Mm -hmm. It's actually helpful for everyone, uh, also people who are highly intelligent. Confusion yeah. never really works. Uh, and in this ki in crisis situation, you don't need to be so subtle. You need to be clear and you have to be consistent. In yeah. I will uh, ask our colleague Sylvia now what uh, the people joining this webinar are uh, thinking about the answer to this question, Sylvia? Yes, uh, I have one uh, comment that uh, um, from our Indian colleague. Uh, to improve health literacy, I think we need videos that demonstrate clearly what we need. A, why wear masks? B, why keep spatial distancing? And C, why wash hands frequently? Uh, do you have any comments on that? Yes, I think that's a very valid point, whether it's videos or other forms of uh, illustrations uh, that I leave in the middle, because maybe sometimes videos are also not, not implementable in certain contexts. But it's very true that um, um, everything that, that can show things and demonstrate things in, an, in another way than words is definitely worth uh, adding to it. And in combination or not, I think we need to make better use of that for sure. Yeah, okay, thank you. And there was a question I saw in the chat from uh, our colleague uh, Xavier Gallego. How do you build credibility and trust in health promotion among the hardest to reach groups? Yes, very good question as well. And I think here, I think we need to build on our, on our knowledge in terms of working with communities and, and not relying on, on the simple truth that we think experts have. I think we should combine different types of expertise. So, uh, I mean, same way we use the information of virologists uh, and, and that's an important asset. I think we should um, listen to specialists of the community who know exactly what things are, um, are easier to understand within their community, are easier to, to change also within their community and to, to, to combine these different forms of, uh, of expertise with each other. Yeah. So, so here are the answers of our audience, uh, Stefan. So the people know where to find the information that scores uh, 2.9. Mm -hmm. um, what is your uh, comment on that? Uh, 
I'm, I'm actually surprised that it's not more because I think uh, information is, is abound. Uh, on yeah. I'm less surprised about um, the, the, the distinction between fake news and valid data. And I think indeed this shows the, the need to, to rely also on, on, on those um, capacities of people and to strengthen those capacities and to, to emphasize that more than simply assuming that everybody will have that capacity to distinguish. Yeah. And finally, the people have necessary skills to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think uh, it seems to be uh, like a, a very middle position. Um, yep. So basically the glass is slightly more than half full. Yep. Um, people have skills, but I think we still can build more. Yep. So there's work to do. There's work to do. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia. We go back to the presentation and to the uh, third question. So there will be probably several waves. Well, we expect a second wave of COVID and maybe others of other pandemics or disasters. I mean, think about the environment, uh, things are changing. So what do you think are the health promotion recommendations for a sustainable response to the pandemic and for the future? And for the audience, uh, that you can use your book lab again, will health promotion be widely implemented in managing future pandemics? And while you think about that question, um, Stefan will answer, will continue with his presentation. Stefan? Yes. So I think um, it, it's, it's important the word sustainable here is, is, is important. So I think we have uh, um, the situation of crisis and we have also all the after effects. So a sustainable reply to the COVID-19 pandemic should go beyond the crisis and should also look at, at the total picture. And I think that's where health promotion really can contribute. And I think it is really drawing on, on skills and expertise that we expect health promotion workers to have. Um, and so that includes, as I mentioned before, the, 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 the more as uh, not just sustainable, but also more evidence-based ways of helping people, facilitating people to not only adopt protective behavior, but also maintain it. And so uh, much more uh, fine-tuned and much more evidence-based than what we've seen so far in dealing with the epidemic. Uh, secondly, I think the, um, the health literacy aspect, I think should also be part of the, um, of the reply. Um, not only to deal with this wave, but also for the next waves, if there are any or other pandemics, if, if necessary. So I think we should um, rely on, on the fact that people will want information, will need information, and that will also help them to take their own control. But that means that we have to invest in helping people to develop the competences to, to, to deal with information and to make the distinction between accurate and non-accurate or reliable and non-reliable health information. We should also definitely act on the organizational and community level. Um, so um, meaning uh, that we have to look at the strengths that are there, which as, as we mentioned already, actually were surprisingly active and resilient, but I think it's important to not just leave it at that, but see, okay, how can we even strengthen that resilience of organizations, of communities, how can we strengthen the support that we find within communities and make sure that they don't peter out? And uh, I think uh, there we can definitely draw on um, a lot of uh, expertise in health promotion with the settings approach. Um, we know how for years we've worked on building health promoting schools, uh, health promoting um, workplaces, uh, universities, and cities and so on. So I think this is something we should not just put aside. I think this is where it really becomes interesting and important. This is what we can help deliver because that is not something other health workers, health specialists can, can bring in. This is our task. This is what health promotion can bring. And um, that's one part of the answer. The other answer, part of the answer is that, of course, um, every crisis is also an opportunity to learn. And we should probably learn from this crisis to, uh, to face and give a better 
answer to the ones that might be coming up. And so first of all, I think health promotion should realize that infectious diseases are still important. Um, to some extent, um, we seem to have forgotten that a little bit. Um, HIV AIDS left aside, I think we have mainly looked at non-communicable diseases for good reasons, uh, because they were the, the, the biggest burden of disease and still are a, big, a very big burden of disease all over the world, of course. But as COVID-19 teaches us, it's, it's not the only threat. I think we have to, to stay also uh, um, in, in connection with the, the possibility of new infectious diseases coming up. So I think we have to look at not only the, the, the importance of it, because that's not even our main task, but specifically on how we can rely on our knowledge to change and to build more resilience organizationally and individually. Um, and that means that we not only look at explaining and, and using causal explanations, but also to look at how we can implement the knowledge that we have uh, to a better way. So understanding the impact of the, inf the infectious diseases and how to tackle them, but also implementing that knowledge. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I think we should really uh, recognize as health promoters is that health is not something that's a standalone. Um, Everybody working in health thinks that health is the most important thing in the world, and that's of course true, but health is not something that just happens. It's part of a bigger picture. And uh, in the context of, of COVID-19, that's very apparent because it is basically a disease that came from animals and that somehow crossed over. It's also a disease that managed to spread across the world, not because it's um, not just by itself, but because of the mobility in this globalized world, and probably also uh, the lack of, uh, of attention for a sustainable environment. So if we want to tackle crises like this in the future, I think we have to look at one health, the one health that recognizes the interconnection between animal health and human health, between the planet's health and, and human health. And so this is something that uh, I think health promotion as a discipline, sub-discipline, should also pay attention to. And then, of course, uh, we should learn how to respond more swiftly to, uh, to things that happen uh, more like a crisis. Again, health promotion is not really the, the best fitted to respond quickly to crisis situations, but I think we can contribute. And if we look at how decisions are being made, organizations operate in times of crisis, there's no reason why health promotion should not be interested in that. And I think if we look at some of the knowledge that we already have, we know, for example, that things like social cohesion are incredibly important in times of crisis. We know that trust in public institutions is very important. So I think we can apply ourselves to trying to use our knowledge and link that also to dealing with crisis situation and possibly future opportunities. So I think uh, we have to expect, to accept, sorry, that, um, um, Although we all like to think and want that we can control our health and all that comes with it, I think we should also control the fact that we can't control it and help people to, to live with that belief, but at the same time doing the best we can to make the control as good as possible. So that's what my answer would be to that question. Thank you. How can we influence this one question or comment from uh, one of our participants? How can we influence our governments to balance the investment, uh, you know, between uh, a high uh, cost for hospitals and staff, uh, you know, which is really the focus. We have uh, daily programs about intensive care and all that with the necessary investment in low tech health promotion and public health community activity. Mm -hmm. What's your answer to that? Yeah. Uh, I think I think it's a valid question. Uh, I'm not so uh, pessimistic about that. I think, of course, very rightly so, there is a, a huge interest, interest, and I think everywhere in the world, for, for the healthcare professions who have also been hugely underpaid and underestimated, uh, and, and I think we see a surge there. So, But I think uh, health promotion can probably ride that, that wave a little bit and surf that wave as well. I think the interest... The renewed interest in health, I think, is unprecedented as well as the, as the crisis. So I think uh, health has become, again, a top priority. And I think um, public health will also benefit from that. I think 
politicians will have a very hard time denying that public health is certainly also worth the investment and yeah. certainly not uh, the moment to start uh, putting that down. Of course, that's one part of the question, so we can use that opportunity. Of course, we have to grasp the opportunity. Uh, another core capacity of public health and health promotion people is the possibility to advocate. And I think we should, of course, advocate as well and keep on advocating and say that we have something to offer. Uh, this seminar is part of it, uh, but I think we yeah. should also uh, spread that word more, that word more widely. Okay. Sylvia, uh, you, in the meantime, you have collected the answers to the third question on Book Lab. So I give the, the screen back to you. Yes, thank so you. you can maybe share that and maybe you have uh, other questions in between. I'll share my screen. Uh, yeah. You can see the participants are very anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> That's 100%. Okay. <laughs> health promotion will be widely implemented in managing future pandemics. <laughs> okay. So I see my hope is uh, my positive expectation is shared by the participants in this uh, seminar. So in the next time we'll have uh, health promotion staff in the national uh, crisis outbreak teams or yeah, management. <laughs> I think that's beginning to, to already be the case in a number of countries. I don't have any statistics about that and I certainly don't claim to have a global overview of who's part of which team, uh, but I think uh, the voices are being heard. And of course, uh, as with many changes in society, I think we can hope a little bit also to set some good examples in some countries, which will then be followed by others. Yeah, uh, but I do think we have to keep on repeating that promotion has a contribution to make. Yeah, that COVID there, is, there is one more uh, question, Stefan, before we show the answer to the first question, if you have that available, Sylvia. Mm -hmm. but the question is how to achieve awareness of social and community responsibility when the perception of personal seriousness is so low. That's a question here on the chat box. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I think that's uh, that's again a good question, but um, well, first of all, I'm not 100% sure if the personal um, perception is necessarily that low amongst the majority of the people. I think what we often see is that there's a, sometimes a sizable minority, and of course they are also an important uh, group to work with and to talk with, but I wouldn't say that the majority of people are necessarily unaware. Mm -hmm. uh, or are not, not convinced. So that's one. And then the other one is, of course, I think we should use the ways of, of influencing more social norms um, more actively. And I think um, we have not really used up all the possibilities of influencing, and, and that can be done uh, in various ways. I think examples of, of uh, celebrities would certainly be the way to go. Um, yeah. I think uh, also social influences using social media is clearly also for young people a way to, to go about. So I think there are ways that we uh, that we can think of. Uh, these are just a few that I yeah. at the top of my head, but I'm, I'm okay. sure that we have some of the mechanisms. Uh, oh. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think there are more questions to come, but we're almost at the end of the webinar. And uh, Sylvia, can you share us the uh, answer to the first question? You know, the, the keywords to describe the contribution of health promotion and managing the pandemic. And can you just let your m mind uh, go um, uh, think out loud, uh, Stefan, when you see this? Yes. Uh, well, one of the things that really pleases me a lot, um, is although, that, although I, I talked a lot about lifestyle, behavior change, and so on, and you see that coming back through, but at the center, uh, in very big letters, I see community empowerment, so mm. community and empowerment. Uh, and I think those are uh, key words, and I think those are the, the things that I think we need to invest in even more now. Um, I think there's an awareness also amongst uh, governments, governments sorry, and decision makers that, that behavior change is important. I think we should also uh, convince them even more so that uh, communities are important and that empowerment is at the end of the day the way that we can help face 
um, the, the challenge of, of COVID-19. But it won't yeah. be just by imposing behavior change, it will also be by empowering people and communities. Okay, so it reflects very much uh, the spirit of your uh, presentation. I don't uh, know if it reflects the spirit of the presentation, but uh, if it reflects the spirit of the people who participated, then I'm very happy. Well, they have, they have uh, uh, completed this, so uh, I guess the answer will be yes, uh, Stefan. And um, uh, thank you very much. It's exactly uh, uh, one hour after we started. Uh, I think uh, you've answered all the questions. Uh, I think you have raised a lot of questions. We were not able to answer all the questions from our audience and uh, hope to find a way to continue with that. For Stefan, you want a closing word before I refer to the website? Well, no, I was going to say, I, I trust that this will also be available uh, also to those who could not attend or those who want to reach, to see this again <laughs> or who want to pose more questions. And so um, I can be reached for further questions if anybody. Yeah. And uh, we will create a, a web page on the website of the UNESCO chair. You will all get that link to that web page where we have uh, uh, the summary of the talk, the, the slides, and also we have the answers in short uh, video clips available for you and some other further reading resources and so on. And hopefully you can use them in your work to strengthen health promotion in the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, you can see the link already on the, uh, in the chat uh, to the, um, the website. And I want to thank you, Stefan, uh, for your time and for your talk and presentation. I want to thank you, uh, my dear colleagues, uh, Valerie and uh, Sylvia and uh, DJ, who could not attend this time. And to everyone who has uh, taken the time to join from wherever you are on the globe. And uh, stay healthy, and uh, we uh, look forward to uh, see you in one of our next webinars or whatever. Have a good evening or day. <laughs>